Well, they come in a couple of different shapes and various colors, and young men have been having fun with them since 1952. Are we talking about the Slinky? No. Are we talking about the Frisbee? No. We're not talking about the Barbie doll either. We're talking about the B-52 Stratofortress, otherwise known as uh, the Buff. The Buff. That's an acronym for Big Ugly Fat fellow. Uh, and Nate, we've uh, got a story today about how the B-52 is going to be extended yet again into the future. Uh, I'm Bill Woodle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is your right angle on this most legendary of airplanes becoming even more legendary. Uh, Steve, uh, I saw a proposal today there. I think General Electric is talking about being able to um, re-engine the B-52, which currently has eight, count them, eight jet engines. Uh, to get that baby into the sky. They would replace them with four high, high bypass turbofans, but the proposal says that the engines that they will be replacing on the B-52, if they are able to re-engine this uh, aircraft, um, will not need to be moved off of the airplane. They will remain in place and just have on-aircraft servicing through the year 2097. 2097. The B-52, if it is re-engined, will not have to have those engines traded out, and it might stay in service till 2097. That's 150 years or something along those lines. <laughs> what is it about the buff, Steve, that uh, that is just so monumental that it just it, it's just a it's one of five or six different aircraft in the in history that are just so perfectly designed that you just any changes you make to replace it makes it worse. Yeah, uh, the B-1 fleet is much younger. The uh, The bones started coming off the manufacturing lines in the early 80s when uh, Reagan got the, reauthorized the, the B-1B after Carter canceled the B-1A. And those airframes are wearing out. Um, the, the Air Force is just scared to death that uh, one of their major bombers is just going to have to be retired because those airframes are wearing out so quickly. But they've got a, a, it's a the damn different swing wings. Yeah, they've they've got a they've got a, a it's a more complicated jet, and it, uh, it it fulfills a different role that's that's harder on that more complicated airframe. The thing about the B fifty two is it's an aircraft carrier of of bombers. And what I mean is that it's incredibly useful just because it's so damn big. You know, an aircraft carrier puts to sea. You can do a lot of things with that flight deck other than just launch and recover fighters. Um, you, you can do uh, ASW, anti-submarine warfare with helicopters. You can you can uh, move things to different places. It could be a delivery vehicle. You can do rescue work during a during a crisis, you know, some uh, big disaster and all that. And, and aircraft carriers have performed all of these roles and many, many more uh, over the last almost 100 years now that we've been building them since, uh, I guess, since the Langley in the 1920s. Uh, and the B-52 is like that. It's got that huge, huge bomb bay that was designed to carry those massive hydrogen bombs that we were building in the late 40s and early 50s. You know, these things that were just, it was like dropping a house is pretty much what it was. So you needed a plane big enough to do that. Well, once you've got all that space, that is mobile in the air to anywhere in the world almost with refueling, that's incredibly useful. And so the B-52 has performed many different roles over the years. Um, and nobody drops great big hydrogen bombs anymore. And thank God we never had to do so in anger. But they put in these these like they look like revolver barrels filled with nuclear tipped cruise missiles for standoff yep. bombing. They, Rotary deliveries. Yep. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Uh, there there have been proposals to make something similar for the B-52, except instead of uh, being filled up with with nuclear tipped cruise missiles, they'd be filled up with long range or medium range anti-aircraft missiles. Uh for uh, to act as basically a flying armory for F-22s and F-35s and F-15s, F-16s, that they would say they would paint the enemy jets with their radar. But instead of firing off their own missiles and, and depleting their very limited stores, especially in the case of the stealth fighters, the B-52 would just launch as many missiles as it took. Because what the hell? You got that belly stuff full of them. Let them rip. Um I really want to see that happen, by the way, in case you couldn't tell. So, yeah, these engineers in the 50s knew what they were doing. They had to build something 
tough because it was going to carry this massive ordinance. They had to build something durable for the exact same reason. They had to build something long flying because the Soviet Union is not next door and all the rest. And because they over engineered this ugly ass airframe, which is a thing of beauty despite its looks, we're still flying the things and always finding new jobs for them. And if we re-engine these things and make them fly for 150 years, you know, our longest lived aircraft carriers only last about 50 and they don't even fly. Yeah. Uh, Scott, you know, it's one thing to upgrade electronics of an airplane and modernize a particular airplane and so on. But the B-52 is different. The B-52 has not only been modernized, the B-52 has been utterly converted to fill at least three different roles and now perhaps even four or five. Originally started out, as Steve pointed out, as a nuclear deterrent to the Soviets, was carrying our, was our, the main part of the American uh, triad of, of, um, Deterrence was the B-52 bomber carrying hydrogen bombs over the Soviet Union. It was designed to do that. And about 10 years later, they took it to Vietnam, where they found out that if you put enough of these things together, they could drop so many conventional bombs that you basically are removing entire counties with one of these arc-like strikes. Then they said, oh, we don't need these 50 caliber machine guns in the back anymore because of uh, the missiles. So we'll take that off and we'll cut the tail down and smooth out the aerodynamics a little bit. And then the next thing you know, as Steve pointed out, it's able to launch cruise missiles, still do conventional bombing work. There's talk now about it being uh, equipped with laser weapons and so on. Oh. Um, the plane has <laughs> the plane has has managed to get into so many different roles, in my opinion, I suspect, because it had to be built so tough for its original job. There have been many opportunities to replace the B-52 with like a converted 767 or something, I haven't done it. And I reason, the reason that hasn't happened, if I had to guess, would be that a 767 is designed to fly through heavy turbulence, but the B-52 was designed to fly through the shockwave of a hydrogen bomb. And, <laughs> um, and, and that makes for a, a, a pretty tough old buff. Do you, do you feel any of the kind of just the sort of legendary awe that surrounds this airplane, even though you're not an airplane guy? Yeah, yes, I do. And there are a couple of things I think of here. Uh, number one is the, the military often gets a bad rap for wasting money on new technology and pouring billions of dollars into the development of new airframes. Um, I think if you're going to be critical, which you should, uh, you, every once in a while you need to tip your hat to the Pentagon and say, hey, boys, Nice job keeping this thing in the air all that time. I mean, imagine the money that you save by not trying to reinvent something that was already perfect, not just for the originally designed job, but almost as kind of a modular platform where you can take pieces off, plug other pieces in. I mean, it's the kind of thing that some inventors are trying to do today with automobiles and other kinds of technology to make it that way. But these guys figured out how to do this back in the 1950s. And I don't know how much of an impact, but I can't, I can't imagine it would be insignificant to say that the people who were developing this kind of airframe then had seen World War II. They had seen the kind of difficulties that every machine uh, had to face in being able to maintain its battle worthiness in the midst of chaos. Um, and I remember my grandfather, who was a tank commander in World War II, telling me about how the guys who actually drove the tanks uh, would figure out ways to, to improvise and upgrade the tanks in the field. For example, to cut through hedgerows in France with, you know, basically putting a, a lawnmower on the front of, of tanks so that they could plow through these really thick hedgerows. And that kind of um, innovation spurred by necessity uh, had to be in the blood of those guys who designed something like this. Um, and so the other thing that had occurred to me is that this B-52 uh, is the COBOL of aircraft. Uh, COBOL is a programming <laughs> language that has outlasted by far anybody's expectation of it. And recently we found out, especially uh, during some recent crises, that there was a great need for COBOL programmers because many financial institutions and government institutions are still using this language that is considered to be you know, below today's uh, college graduates with their IT degrees. And, uh, but it's solid as a rock and it's reliable and you can continue to use it in various iterations uh, throughout time. And then finally, I just wanted to finish with this. Uh, while yes, this was an aircraft designed uh, to deliver hydrogen bombs over the Soviet Union, 
almost to the same extent, it was an aircraft designed to not deliver hydrogen bombs to the Soviet Union. In other words, when you're going to send a plane up with a hydrogen bomb on board, you want to make sure that in the high likelihood that you're not actually going to deploy that bomb, that that plane comes back and lands safely and everybody's okay. And two classic movies from the 60s came out of that exact scenario. One of them was a comedy called Dr. Strangelove, and the other one was not a comedy called Failsafe. They're both terrific movies. Um, my, my impression of the B-52, I've, I've walked around them several times on the ground, is that, believe it or not, if you actually do get to walk up to a B-52, you'll be quite taken at how small it is. And the reason I say that is because the fuselage is very long and narrow. And once you get used to jumbo jets, once you get used to wide body jets and see them all the time through the glass at airports, you see a B-52. I saw one on a, on a gate guard on a pylon. I thought it was a model. It's, it's actually relatively small airplane. But it is an immor- it's an immortal airplane. It's an immortal design. Um, most people don't realize that uh, when you go from one end of the country to the other today, you're traveling about as fast as you did in the 707 and came out in the late 50s. You're traveling at about 550 miles an hour. The B-52 could put another 100 miles an hour on top of that. It could do 650 miles an hour. That's fast for a subsonic plane. But it's just so versatile and so tough and so iconic that there are any number of stories about this airplane. And I will just share with you, uh, to, by the way, not only is the B-52 formed those roles that we mentioned earlier, it has also served as a launch platform for the X-15 and for the X-43. It is an actual, la- it's, a, it's a launch delivery system. It's, it's an amazing airplane. Um, they have become so iconic that they've actually got their own names. The B-52 that launched all of those drops was called Balls 8 because its number was B-52-008. Uh, we just recently lost a, a B-52 because of a fire in the cockpit. They went out to the boneyard at Davis Mothin, found a good looking one called um, Ghost Rider and dragged it out of seven years of storage in the in the Arizona sun, dusted her off a little bit, fired her up. And the people who were flying her back to um, to get her back into service said that every one of those eight engines just put out this huge count of black smoke and, and fire. And that's how these buffs come back to life, man. It's just fantastic. The two stories, just very quickly, that I think just say an awful lot about this airplane. I, I had a friend who grew up in Okinawa. And um, and the air base in Okinawa was the closest base to the Soviet Union in the event of a nuclear war. It would be the first physical location hit with nuclear weapons. And so they had B-52s on alert all the time. And he would tell me that every now and then they'd be in the movie theater on the base, just watching a movie in the afternoon. And all of a sudden, these two enormous red signs on the side of the screen would just light up and it would say purge, I think was the word, and wonk, wonk, wonk. And the lights come up and these grown men in flight suits are trying not to trample women and children as they run their butts out into the into the sunlight and make for those bombers. The guys who were in the movie theaters probably wouldn't have made it, but the guys who were in the airplanes that were ready to go probably would have. My friend told me that during those those scrambles, when they actually did happen, and nobody really knew if it was real or not, he and his friends would ride down to the departure end of the runway, and they'd just lie on their back and watch these things just take off over them, these V-shaped things, leaving eight black streaks of smoke as they go climbing for altitude and distance to get away from that, from that blast radius. I said, you just stayed out there and in the in the daylight he said at least we get a good view is not going to help us any if we're in a building or anything this is where hell is going to come down but my favorite all-time story about the b-52 has to do with the fact that the engines that they're talking about replacing they would replace them with four modern wide high bypass engines they've done that with the 707 conversions to the kc-135 they've re-engined that airplane but the B-52 as configured now has eight count them eight i said eight jet engines two in four pods underneath. My favorite story about the B-52 actually comes from a pilot of a fighter plane. I think he was in an F-100. His plane was in trouble and he was back in the States and he needed to get back down on the ground. And so he he was back at his Air Force base, conduct, contacted the tower and said that he needed to land. He had an emergency and the tower said uh, negative. It was an F-100, I think, negative. Uh, there's a B-52 on a five mile final and she's lost an engine. And uh, the fighter pilot said, oh, the dreaded seven engine approach. (laughs) (laughs) And that is why this plane is just so legendary. 
Um, you just, you can't beat it. You can only make it worse. The B-52, the Cessna 172 Skyhawk, the C-130 Hercules, and the 737. Honestly, perfect airplanes that simply get better and better and better. And I remember being impressed when I heard that the B-52 was already being flown by grandchildren of the men who flew the originals. Same airframe, by the way. If this is true, you'll be able to say, I am flying the very same jet that my great, 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 great grandfather first flew 170 years ago or something like that. I don't know if it gets there, but if any plane deserves to be flown into service into 2097, it's the B-52. Good for you, you nasty old buff. Keep them in the skies and don't ever go away, you sweet summer child. That'll do it for this edition of Right Angle Made Possible by the members at BillWhittle.com. Uh, thank you very much for those of you who joined. We love having you there. Our, our membership forum is a fun place to meet and, uh, and uh, talk to fun and exciting people. And we'll see you right here next week on Right Angle. Right Angle.